It's only December 1st. It's the first week of Advent. And I don't know about you, but I already feel hopelessly behind in my holiday preparations. On Black Friday, when everyone else was out scooping up all the bargains, I decided to sit on the couch and watch Gilmore Girls. <laughs> and then on Cyber Monday, when everyone sat with their fingers hovered over the keyboard, taking advantage of those buys you could not resist, I took a pass and heard from all of my friends the hundreds of dollars they saved by shopping on that day, and I missed it. And finally, we got to Giving Tuesday, and the emails that showed up in my mailbox and the letters in my snail mailbox all informed me of how easy it would be to give on that day, and yet I gave nothing. I'm failing already at this holiday season. These fairly recent secular holidays that have been created for us in an attempt to dictate when and how we begin our engagement of this season are exhausting me. We're already behind and we have not yet begun. Does anyone else here share my sense of panic? Show of hands. So let's just, let's just take a breath, a deep breath and a moment of quiet here. We've been talking about silence in our prayers, but we haven't experienced it yet in this place. And so I will invite all of you to simply for a moment, close your eyes, breathe deeply, and listen to the quiet. Welcome to Advent. A mystical season that we are in of waiting and hope and spiritual anticipation. This has always been one of my favorite seasons of the year when I don't get captured by all the other stuff and manage to stay focused on it. Authentically, what this season means for me. In these coming weeks, we gradually approach the winter solstice the shortest day and the longest night of the year. There's something sacred about moving through this month as we move and the darkness increases and the light diminishes. There's a tension in Advent between the darkness and the light. And a surprise each and every year when that astronomical phenomenon happens and the process begins to reverse itself and we celebrate that in fact the darkness never overcomes the light. In these coming weeks, we also celebrate and anticipate the coming of Christ. Now frankly, for some of you sitting out there, this is a really confusing thing and it's, it's meant to be. We're anticipating the birth of the baby Jesus, God incarnate among men. But at the same time, we are anticipating and remembering the Christ who is already with us. And we're thinking about the Christ who will come again in our future. The God who is not yet here. The God who's fully present to us. The God who will come again. If that confuses you, it's meant to. It's called paradox. And it's part of the mystery of the season. The waiting, the wondering, the longing, the hoping. How do we manage to get ourselves there and stay there in that place and not get captured by all of the striving and the procuring that accompanies this season? <clears throat> one of the things that we have learned in the church over the centuries is that one of the ways we stay there is through scripture, by immersing ourselves in these stories again and again and coming to understand how they speak to us anew in tonight's gospel reading, we visited the widow in the temple. And one of the things we have to recognize about this passage is that where we dropped in in the scripture passage was actually act two. Act one 
which we didn't read aloud, comes in the chapter before, and has Jesus and his disciples sitting in the temple watching the rich rulers called the scribes wander around in their elegant robes, eating the finest of foods, and basically living off the tithes and offerings of the poor. And Jesus and the disciples are in conversation about this injustice of the rich temple rulers who seem to benefit from the offerings of those who have nothing. And then we enter Act 2. Act 2 is when the widow enters. An insignificant woman who has only two small coins to offer in the plate. And Jesus notices that what she is giving is all that she has to give. And he comments on the unfairness about the situation. So let's talk, first of all, about what we don't know about this story. We don't know the woman's name, which is no big surprise in most of Scripture. We don't really hear the names of women unless they're rich women or married to powerful men. They're simply characters because in this time, women were just chattel property, not worth being mentioned by name. The other thing we don't know about this woman is her motivation for coming to the temple and putting in the two small coins. There's a lot of layering of interpretation that has accompanied the scripture passage over time. And most of us now tell the story as if it were a story about her generosity and her humility and her open and willing heart. But in fact, the scripture says nothing about that. It simply says the woman showed up. She put in the two coins. So let's talk about what we do know about this story. We know something about the role that widows played in first century Palatine. The laws of marriage at that time were set up so that family members, when there was a death in the family, would remarry the wives of brothers and sisters and siblings to take care of the widows. So that we know if someone is remaining a widow, it means she has no one caring for her. She is the lowest of the low in society. We know that her presence in this story is meant to emphasize the social corruptness of this situation. So what's really happening here in this story? Well, we ought to note that Jesus is not magically transforming this woman's world. He doesn't bless her life five chapters later. We don't read about her later of experiencing abundance because she gave sacrificially at this time. This is not a prosperity gospel story. Jesus simply notices her. He sees her. And that is no small thing in this setting for a man of this time to notice and call out a woman, especially a woman with no means. And then she simply goes on her way. So what is it that we should take from this story? What is it meant to tell us? Well, the power of scripture is that it has all these levels and layers of meaning that we can interpret. And because I'm the one who's got the microphone tonight, I get to give you my interpretation of the story. Here's what I want to invite you to think about. We are all the widow in this story. We could be any character in the story, but I want you to think about the way in which you are the widow. We all have a scarcity of one kind or another in our lives. For some of us, it's a financial scarcity. And this season is frightening to us. All the things we have to buy and the ways we have to manage a budget when we already feel like we're drowning under the water. For others of us, the scarcity we have to deal with is an absence of health or our own stamina and the thought of travel that we have to do and, and uh, other places we have to negotiate is frightening to us. Some of us just don't have enough love. Some of us have too little talent to share or not enough faith. We don't, we don't know how to believe in a, seizing, in a season when believing is supposed to be so important. 
And for many of us, the scarcity that we live under is simply not having enough time. All of us are wanting and lacking in something, just like the poor widow. This, I believe, is a story about how God meets us in our scarcity. In the places where we don't have enough, where we ourselves feel like we are not enough, God stands with us in that insufficiency. And we are transformed as a result of that. God changes us. We become abundant, not our circumstances. The scarcity remains. But who we are in those scarce moments can be transformed by this Jesus who calls out the injustice and calls us out by name. I want to share an example with you of this from my own life. This is a point in time in my life from about 10 years ago. It was a season for me when the real scarcity in my life was time. I had just begun a new job that involved a lot of travel nationally that took me in and out of town all the time. I still had two children living at home. I was a wife. I was um, negotiating my way through the first years of ministry. And there was never enough time to do anything. There weren't enough hours in the day, in the week, or in the month. And I had become downright miserly about my time, hanging on to it, making sure that nobody got any part of it that wasn't justified to give away making sure that I wasn't losing control of the little bit of time I had. And on this particular night, this story that I am telling you, I was preparing to leave town for yet another work trip. I hadn't packed yet. The work was mostly done, but I needed some supplies for the work I was going to do out of town. I was doing laundry to get ready to go. And wouldn't you know it that my youngest son, Jonathan's socks, which had been looking a little raggedy lately, all chose this one washing to suddenly simply fall apart. Now, in my neurotic mom compulsion, I convinced myself I could not possibly go out of town until Jonathan had new socks. Never mind that his father could have gone to the store to buy the new socks. A good mother would not leave town with a kid with holy socks. And so, I worked in a trip to Myers. I had a bunch of things I was going to get. I had it well-timed. I got in the car. I knew what aisles to go down. It was all working just like it was scheduled to work. I checked out, and I stood for a moment trying to get my bearings, trying to remember which door I should go out of, when I heard it the first time, a very quiet voice that said, excuse me. I didn't respond. Then a tap on my shoulder, and the voice a little more insistent. Excuse me. And I turned. And I saw a rather infirm looking older man with his wife clinging to his arm. And she was staring distantly off into space. And he said to me, My wife and I are here shopping. And she needs to use the restroom. And she is blind. Would you help her? Now, what I'm embarrassed to tell you is what went through my mind. Because the first thoughts that went through my mind is, don't they hire people to do this? Aren't there people here that are hospitable that can take people to the bathroom at the Meyer store? The second thought I had was, like, what do I have posted on my forehead that of all the people here, he came to ask me? Now, fortunately, I hope none of that registered on my face and that it was a quick blip in my mind before my mind self-corrected and the filter dropped in, and I thought, I'm a Christian. I'm an ordained Christian. I'm supposed to want to do stuff like this. <laughs> and so I said, of course I will take your wife to the restroom. And so I grabbed her a little too firmly by the arm and began moving quickly, only to realize that she was shuffling very slowly. So I, I, I slowed down and measured my pace to match hers. We went into the, to the restroom, and she went into the stall, and, um, and I started looking at my watch, and it was 10 minutes. And that entire 10 minutes, I paced, and I looked at my watch, 
and I started crossing things off of my to-do list that were not going to get done that night because I was taking that extra 10 minutes to do this deed. I asked her several times if she was okay. She said she was fine. Finally, she finished and she came out. And as she came out, she was humming a little tune and she had a wonderful smile on her face and came over to the sink and we turned the water on. And she chose to wait until the water was fully warm before she put her hands under the faucet to wash her hands. And that's when I really started paying attention because I heard her cooing gently as her hands rested under the warm water. And I looked at her face and I realized that this woman was in a pure state of joy about washing her hands. And that's when I really began to pay attention. I took the towel, the paper towel, over to her to dry her hands, and she grabbed my hands in hers and just held them there for a moment. And I don't know how else to describe this other than to say that the gaze of this blind woman looked directly into my soul and saw me and settled my soul in an instant. In an instant, I had this full sense that it was God holding my hands. There was no verbal voice, but I heard a voice in my head that said, stop it, slow down, pay attention, you're missing it. We dried our hands. I walked her back to her husband. <clears throat> I never learned that woman's name. But I went into my car in the parking lot and I sat and I wept. I cried for all of the times that my hastiness and my urgency and my stinginess about my time had kept me from seeing miraculous moments like the one I had just experienced. I cried for all of the times that I had failed to be of service because I was too preoccupied with my own thing. I cried for all of the mistaken times that I thought what I was doing was so important that I couldn't take the time to experience joy. You see, in this moment, in this story that I'm sharing with you, I was the widow. I came with my stingy two little coins of not enough time, and I very grudgingly put them in the plate. But it didn't matter that I didn't have a magnanimous heart because God met me there anyway and took that tiny little offering of time that I gave and transformed me in that moment. And you can be transformed this Advent season too. What is the scarcity in your life? that you're struggling to keep control of this season of Advent? Where are you lacking? And I invite you to simply surrender it. Not surrender it in the sense of giving up, but surrender in terms of yielding, letting it go, the need for control, and wait to see where God shows up to bless you with an abundance of spirit. Amen.